All right, of course, keeping an eye on the markets. We continue to see the rally here, a bit of a rebound rally after two days of selling. David Bonson joining us right now. He's a chief investment officer over at the Bonson Group, which has $3.5 billion in assets under management. David, always uh, wonderful to catch up with you. Let's start off here with the volatility that we've seen in this market. Volatility, we should point out, that predated uh, the war in Ukraine, but of course has accelerated uh, since uh, the Russian uh, invasion uh, into that country here. Uh, how are you managing through that volatility? right now and do you anticipate that it could tamp down anytime soon I wouldn't expect it will tamp down anytime soon, but I think it'll tamp down eventually. The problem is it's still pretty early into this uh, geopolitical distress event. Uh, but you're right. The volatility predated Russia, Ukraine, and a lot of that was focused in what we at my firm call the shiny object asset class. A lot of the uh, kind of hot tech, cool tech, some of the crypto SPACs, these meme stocks, IPOs, all the things that were so popular for various parts mm -hmm. of the last 18, 24 months that have just gotten clobbered. And so you actually had pretty low volatility and certainly low drawdowns in a lot of the value areas and a lot of the dividend areas of the market and, of course, in the energy sector. So what do we expect going forward? I expect the volatility now to continue, but for a different reason. It's not so much purging out the excess valuations of some of that tech stuff. It's now more focused on the uncertainty around Russia. Ukraine. And uncertainty around some of the inflationary pressures there. Of course, we don't want to shy away from the fact that this is a human conflict and a humanitarian disaster, as we can see. But there's also an element that this is one that has economic ripple effects and inflationary ones when, well, everyone was already experiencing already, David. Who does that impact the most? How do we manage? Where should you be looking to invest in that scenario? Um, certainly in terms of exploiting it and actually capitalizing on it, the energy sector has been and will continue to be the place to benefit. Now, some of the energy opportunity also predates the Russia-Ukraine situation. That is more exacerbating a trend that also was already in place. But when we ask if the inflationary issues are why volatility is exacerbated, I'm not sure that's the case. I think the volatility almost always goes higher for no reason other than the uncertainty. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Things are volatile because there's an uncertain outcome. Fundamentally, the inflationary pressures ought to be on the table as to what ends up being resolved longer term. Uh, yet, I don't think that's what's happening day by day right now. I think you, you really can't get a couple up 600, 700 point days and a couple down 500, 400 point days if the reason people are concerned is inflation, because the inflation story didn't change, yet the up and down volatility did. That, to me, is a sign of weak hands that get sold out and value hands that come in to take advantage of lower prices. Interesting. You also talk a lot about appreciating the intent of asset allocation. Go cross asset yeah. for us. The role of bonds, full faith and credit, the volatility that we've seen. What does that role play in asset allocation? Well, you know, unfortunately, even for a big believer in asset allocation like we are at my firm, uh, the fact of the matter is a 60-40 uh, investor right now is not benefiting from asset allocation because you have treasury bonds down at the same time that equity portfolios are down. Uh, it has happened a grand total of three times in the last 100 years that people had their uh, bond portfolios and equities go down in the same year. We're only in the very early part of March. We have no idea where things go from here. But asset allocation right now has to be more thoughtful than just 60-40, and particularly on the 40 side of things, using a long-dated treasury when you were already at the 1.5% on a 10-year. That doesn't give you enough hedge against equity volatility. And that's the downside of the zero-bound interest rate policy is it's taken away the ability of bonds to be an effective 
active diversifying instrument inside of an equity portfolio. So we're big believers in alternative investments. We're utilizing hedge funds, real estate, private equity, commodities. Uh, those are not risk-free assets, obviously. It's just they're different risk assets. Rather than traditional interest rate risk mm. or equity beta risk, it invites a different risk, but still a diversifying component. Do you look at commodities at all in this environment under these circumstances as a hedge, David? No, I think if anything, they're probably a higher beta component. And so we, for example, as big energy investors, we don't want to take that uh, position through a long oil position. We want to buy Chevron, right? We want to be invested in natural gas infrastructure, uh, companies that are going to be exporting LNG, for example. So that has a commodity exposure to it, but we don't want to just simply take on the, the price risk of the underlying commodity mm. with which, to your point, may not be a diversifier in an asset allocation right now. It might actually just leverage up uh, beta around yeah. global cyclicality. David Bonson, so straight talking, we love it. Thank you, CIO of the Bonson Group. Stay well. See you soon. We